Hey everybody, welcome to the online edition of The Gathering. My name is Nick, and it has been two weeks since we've done this here together, so let's see if I remember even how to do this. Uh, we're glad that you are joining us here in the online space. The Gathering is a group of people who have come together in about the past year uh, to do church and life together. It's made up of two different churches on paper, technically, uh, Zion Lutheran Church and Pathways Church, two churches that come from different backgrounds, different ways of doing things, different styles, uh, but uh, who met each other and decided that the things we have in common are really more important than the things that we have that are different. And in a world where, well, people who come from different backgrounds and perspectives don't often get along together anymore, we decided wouldn't it be kind of cool and a novel idea to actually model what it looks like to partner and work together. And so we are still technically two separate churches, but we do a lot of our stuff together, uh, particularly our big gatherings, which we have just kind of called the gathering because it was the most generic name <laughs> possible. Uh, that no one could fight over, right? Uh, just this idea of the gathering and we meet together and uh, it's not a group that much fights together anyway. And so we've come together and are doing a lot of this stuff. And if you want to read a little bit more about us, you want to get a little sense of kind of who we are, a good way to do that, of course, is online. Uh, you've already found the internet because you're here. Uh, so if you want to go over to everettgathering.com, you can learn a little bit more about the partnership of these two groups. And you can even read the core values on there, which are the things that actually brought us together because we all agreed around those core values. And so that's sort of what brought us together. And uh, whenever you got time, I would encourage you to take a look at that website. Now, the way that we like to describe ourselves, if perchance this is your first time just jumping on and connecting with this group is we usually words two word use two words to describe ourselves and the first is that we are cautious we are a group that is a little cautious about organized religion and um, you say well maybe I'm a little like that too I'm a little cautious about organized religion well we understand that uh, most of us have grown up in religious environments or surrounded by religion and we've definitely seen religion used in some ways that is uh, good and useful and positive and beneficial and even inspiring. We've seen religion used in some really good ways. But many of us have also seen religion used in some ways that is sort of toxic or harmful, exclusionary. And some of us personally or even just people that we know and love have been really harmed by organized religion. And so we find ourselves being a little cautious. Some would even go so far as to say skeptical of organized religion. And I get it. I know that's weird because we are, by definition, as a church, uh, a at least loosely organized group of people. But we actually think that that tension being a little cautious about organized religion while also being a group of organized religious folk is sort of a healthy tension to have. Now, the other word we use to describe ourselves is curious. And by that, we mean we like to ask a lot of questions. We like to uh, ask questions about things that we don't know, of course, and uh, I imagine that there are quite a few churches where it's okay to ask questions about things you don't know. Uh, and that is all good, and we're open to that too. We love that idea. But when we say curious, uh, in part what we mean, and maybe even in large part, is the idea that we like to ask a lot of questions about things that we think we've already got the answers to. Because it turns out that it's in those areas where usually our biggest blind spots are hiding. And so there's all sorts of ways of thinking or believing that have been handed down to us. And we like to take a lot of our time uh, looking at some of those things, analyzing them for some of us for the very first time, and uh, looking at them and deciding, is this something that works? Did it work before? It doesn't work now. Uh, did it work before? It does work now. Uh, did it never really work and we need new ways of thinking? And we like to explore a lot of options and alternatives of ways to think. And sometimes we do all this investigation and we end up right back where we started and everything's good. And other times we decide, nope, there needs to be a little change here. And so anyway, we're a curious group that likes to ask a lot of questions, uh, particularly about things we think we already have answers to. Now, if any of that sounds sort of interesting to you, then I would encourage you to check out the website to learn a little bit more about us and maybe connect in with this group because... Uh, it might be something that's beneficial and helpful to you. Now, what we're going to be doing here in the next couple moments is sort of an abbreviated version of our church worship service. Uh, we do meet in person at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings in Everett. Uh, but here in the online space, we do kind of a miniaturized version of that. And so one of the things we're going to do now is sing. Our worship leader, Billy, is going to come on the screen. He's just going to lead uh, in one song here. Uh, we're getting really close to being able to live stream our whole in-person thing. 
Uh, but for now, we're just going to do one song. Billy will lead us in that. And then after that, there will be uh, kind of a little um, reflection video. And today it's on the story, the Bible text story that we're going to be looking at. And uh, after that, then I will come on the screen and I have a little sermon message here for us today that has to do uh, with wisdom. We had a little series going there in uh, August on wisdom, and we're going to wrap that up today with a final message on wisdom. And then to finish everything out, uh, we are going to do a time of communion. And so uh, in our in-person gatherings, we take communion every week. And we have the elements already provided for you. Uh, the bread, which represents Jesus' body, and the cup, it represents his blood. Nothing magical about those elements, whether you take them in our physical location or whether you come up with some sort of elements uh, to substitute for them here online. Really, the sacredness in engaging in this opportunity uh, has to do with the intent that you bring to it, not the specific items that you have on hand. So if you would like to participate in communion today, uh, you'll need to round up a couple items, something for the bread, which could be a little chunk of bread or it could be a little cracker, that would be fine, uh, or something for the cup. Uh, it could be a little bit of juice or maybe you have some wine left over from last night. Uh, you want to get those things on hand and we will carve out a little space. A little video will play, a reflection video uh, that you can pray and take communion uh, whenever you would like. And so uh, you can even hit pause during that time if you need more time. Uh, but we like to create an opportunity uh, for you to take communion. Now, I think that's pretty much it in terms of direction. Uh, Billy's going to come on the screen, lead us in a song, and then it'll be a little video. And then I'll see you right back here. And today we'll talk a little bit about wisdom as we wrap up that series. Okay, let's get right to it. Billy, why don't you take it away?
came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. I am yours. I am forever yours. Mountain high, valley low. I'll sing out, remind my soul that I am yours. I am forever yours. Cause love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. And I am yours. I am forever yours. Mountain high, valley low. I'll sing. The younger brother who saw his father as dead, who took his inheritance and spent his fortunes, found himself lost in the squalor of his life, in feeding the pigs and desiring food not fit for him to eat. A famine had crossed over his soul, casting a cloud of poverty and disease. This younger son saw himself as a sinner an outcast to be despised and shamed and hated. In his self-exile, he came to his senses and returned home, returned to himself. And the father who was waiting all this time, seeing him from far off, embraced his child, lavished on him a party, saw his tattered clothing the worn soles of his shoes, adorned him richly with all that he had, in abundance, in plenty. The elder perceived someone not estranged, not other and alien, but as a child to be loved, tenderly, compassionately, extravagantly found to be finally one, becoming whole, as he finally came home. Well, summer is over. I can't believe that. It's crazy. I mean, here we are. Uh, my kids started back to school at the end of this last week, and uh, I just can't believe we're there. To the end of the summer and the beginning of the school year, the summer just went so fast, and I guess it sort of always does. You know, it just seems like it goes quicker than you expect it to. And uh, certainly this year went pretty fast. I remember being a kid, though, and when I was a kid, it felt like summers were just a blip. They just went so fast. You know, you were having all this fun, and then it was time to go back to school. And I was thinking back to one of those summers here this week. Uh, and I used to spend a lot of summers at the lake when I was a kid. And I remember particularly being in eighth grade, we'd spend time at this lake near my house. And there was a place there at the lake called The Cove. And there were some rocks that a bunch of kids like to jump off of into the lake. And I remember going there for the first time when I was in eighth grade and all my friends wanted to jump off the rocks into the lake. And I remember walking up to the edge of those rocks and looking over the edge and thinking to myself, well, it's kind of high up here, you know, like we're pretty high up above 
the water. And I remember looking down and thinking, I'm not so sure it's smart to take this leap off into the air and all the way down to the water. And I remember as we all kind of stood around, I think we were all sort of thinking that, but I stepped back and thought, you know what, I'll just let someone else go first and I'll watch them and we'll just kind of see how it goes. You ever been there? You kind of been ready to take a leap and you want to step back for a moment and just take a look and see what the outcome might be. Well, that's what we want to talk about today. We've been doing a series here uh, in August. I know today is technically not August anymore. We're in September 1st. Uh, but we just want to wrap up this series that we started in August here where we were looking at wisdom, a series called Dig Deep. Uh, we've had our kids in with us in our in-person gatherings uh, during the month of August. And we got this series basically from the children's ministry curriculum that we use. And so we thought that was kind of fun because as adults, we got to see some of the stuff that the kids were learning. And as kids, they got to be surrounded by the adults. And it was uh, material here talking about wisdom that's really useful for kids and adults. And so that's what we, where we've been over the last few weeks. And we thought we would wrap that up today. Now, we defined wisdom early on in this series as knowing the right thing to do or finding out the right thing to do and then doing it. And we discovered that both parts of that definition are important. First of all, there is something to discernment in knowing what is the right thing to do. And we talked about what is the right thing. It means the righteous thing. And we talked about how in the Bible text, you could nearly just translate every time you see the word righteous, you could translate it with the word justice because doing the righteous thing means doing the thing that is just for all. And so that wisdom is not just doing the just or the righteous thing uh, or knowing the just or righteous thing to do, but it's actually doing it. Because if you know the right thing to do and you don't do it, well, that's just foolish. And so that wisdom is both of these things. It's knowing the right thing to do and then also doing it. Now, the last time that we got together, uh, we talked about thinking before we speak. That a way of living in wisdom is to think about the things that we say before we actually say them. And today we don't want to talk about our words. We talked about that last time. Today we want to talk about our actions and we want to talk about what it means to look before we leap. In other words, to consider the consequences and the outcomes, possible outcomes of our actions before we actually do them. Now, a great place to look as we're talking about wisdom and the key verse that comes from the children's ministry curriculum this week is from Proverbs 22, verse 3. It says, the prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. And this is sort of the key verse for the idea of looking before you leap today, because the idea here is that the prudent or the wise, they are looking ahead to see what could happen. They're on the lookout for danger. They see disaster up ahead and they slow down or they change course to protect themselves uh, from unnecessary harm. But the foolish person, or here Proverbs uses the word simple, the foolish or the simple person doesn't bother to look ahead. They don't think through the consequences or see danger. They just keep going anyway. And often, the text says, they pay for it. Now, I hate paying for it, don't you? You know, I've had those moments where I didn't assess things in advance and I had to pay the price. And it's not fun, is it? I mean, I want to avoid that in life as much as possible. And as I get older, I'd like to grow in wisdom. And it turns out that that is not a given. Okay. Just because you get older does not necessarily mean that you become wiser. And the difference between the prudent and the simple or the foolish and the wise here, it's not age. The difference in large part is how you think, especially when it comes to thinking ahead. So wisdom actually involves thinking through the consequences of your actions in advance. And that's what we want to talk about today. How does wisdom think? If you want to be a person who is more wise, how is it that you should think? Well, embracing the way of wisdom means learning to think a few different ways. And the first one is this, learning to think bigger than yourself. Now, our Bible story today starts off with 
a person who makes a bad decision. It's really one bad decision that is rooted in selfishness. And it's a familiar story. It's the one we just saw in the video, the story of the prodigal son. And it starts with a young man who apparently cannot think bigger than himself. So let's read it. It's in Luke 15. We'll start in chapter, or excuse me, in verse 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, as our story starts out here, this is a parable that Jesus is telling, right? And it's about the story of a man who has two sons. And the youngest of these sons wants his inheritance from his father before his father dies. Now, you got to understand how rude that is, all right? I mean, just think about this. Even in, in today's day, right? I mean, if you go to your parent today and say, hey, look, I know you're not dead yet, um, but I've been thinking about what it is that you're probably going to give me in your will when you actually do die, and I'd just like you to give all of that to me right now, even though you're not dead yet. Why don't you just give me everything you were intending to leave me in your will? Give it to me today. Now, in our culture today, I mean, that would be rude. And in this culture, in the in Jesus' era, it was also rude. It was basically telling your dad that he was already dead to you. I mean, you're still alive, but you're dead to me. That's basically what the son is saying. You're dead to me, so just give me the stuff that you were going to give me when you die. Ouch. It's insulting. It's rude. Now, a few years ago, my parents... Uh, we were getting their will together again, you know, and they wanted to figure out everything. And so they sent a list of like everything they owned to me and my two sisters. And they said, we want you just to kind of go through and mark the things that are just really important to you as we try to figure out who we're going to leave things by. And it was just the weirdest assignment ever, right? It was just so morbid and there were such weird things on there. And I remember just kind of reading through it and going like, I don't care. Like all of this stuff is nice, but like I don't much care about the stuff you know, and my sisters kind of felt the same way. And it was just such a weird exercise to go through all their stuff and mark down the things that I wanted when they died. It just felt sort of disrespectful. Now, this guy, though, he doesn't just do an exercise like that. He actually goes to his father and says, I want what you are going to give me when you die. Now, what this kid doesn't realize or maybe he does realize, is that this stuff isn't his stuff. You see, what is going to happen if his father gives him uh, his inheritance right now is the father is going to now have less to live on because he's given so much of his stuff to you. Stuff that you didn't earn. He did. But he is now going to have less to live on so that you can have more. There's selfishness here. Now, I have noticed in life that so many bad or unwise decisions often start with selfishness. I want what I want, and I don't care how it affects or hurts other people. And so maybe a good first place to start thinking about when we're going to leap is asking ourselves some question. How does this affect others. This thing that I'm about to do, is it just about me? What are the consequences for people around me? You see, wisdom knows that life is bigger than just what is happening with me. But the foolish think that their decisions affect only themselves. Now, the second way that wisdom teaches us to think is to think longer than our own desires. And not only does this son insult his father and take half of his wealth, he is now going to blow everything that the father has given him on just frivolous stuff. Let's continue the story here. Verse 13. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, everything that was given to him by his father, set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. The son gets his inheritance, and he quickly just blows it on nothingness. And the text doesn't even tell us 
what he spent the money on. People have made conjectures over time, rabbis have and stuff, but uh, what he actually spends the money on, the text never tells us. Maybe because when you're spending money so fast, it's sort of even hard to keep track of everything that you spent the money on, right? I mean, that's sort of how wasting money works. You kind of get to the end of it and you don't even really know what you spent it on. I remember taking a vacation with the kids and we were out on this vacation. We were kind of walking through this area and they just wanted to buy everything, you know? And they're like, I need that. I want that, you know? And uh, I'd say, no, you don't need that, you know? And they say, yes, we do. And But I was trying to delay them because I knew that they wanted this stuff right now, but I knew they needed to think longer because later in the day we were going to be at the water park and there was going to be tons of stuff there that they wanted. And I didn't want them to blow everything that they had in this moment because I knew that they would want some of that money to be able to buy some nice things at the water park when they got there later. But it's so hard sometimes for us to think longer than the desires that we have just in the moment. There's such a, a danger of desires in immediacy, isn't there? Things that we feel like we need to do right now. So when you come up against immediate desires in your life, it's a great place to stop and think before you leap. And ask some questions. Am I only focused on the short term here? If I go ahead and do this now, what does it mean for the future? Or a question like, will the later me be happy that I did this now? Or maybe another question is simply, what will I miss out on later because I choose to do this now? I mean, those are great questions to ask because many unwise decisions are made because we only care about what is happening now instead of taking a long view of what we want to happen in the future. Now, here's another thing uh, that wisdom uh, teaches us and helping us to learn, and that is to think further than our own situation. Now, here is where this uh, story turns most tragic because the son has blown all of his father's money, and so now he has nothing. And to top it all off, we just learned that there is now, unfortunately, bad timing, a famine in the land. So there is no food. And so this son now is stuck in a hard spot, right? He has no money, and there is no food to eat because it is a time of famine, and he can't see a way out of it. Let's continue the story, verse 15. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Now the situation gets so bad for this young man that he has to go to work and start working somewhere to get some money. But the situation has gotten so bad for him, he is so hungry that he almost eats what the pigs eat, the slop. And see, you only eat pig food when your situation is so bad you can't ever imagine it getting any better. You only are ready to eat pig slop when you have given up. Have you ever t been tempted to give up? To just throw in the towel to eat the pig slop? It's understandable because many of us have found ourselves in positions that seemed very dark. But often we make more unwise decisions because we can't see past our own current circumstances. And we start to think things like, well, what's the use? I mean, it's over anyway. Or, well, it just can't get any worse than this. Or if this is how it is, I guess I'll just stay here. You see, sometimes situations are so bad that it gets us on this sort of destructive spiral. There's a bad situation, which leads to us feeling a little depressed, which leads to us making another bad decision, which leads to us feeling more depressed, and so we make more bad decisions, and it's just sort of a, down roll, a downward spiral. And wisdom involves seeing further than just our current situation because this young man well he really did have another option one that perhaps he should and could have seen first 
but he really does have an option beyond just his current situation. He could just go home. And that's another thing that wisdom teaches us. It teaches us to think deeper about grace. In this case, God's grace. And so the son finally remembers his dad. Now, he probably should have done that earlier. His situation was bad, but if he could just see past his situation earlier, he would have thought about returning home. But probably he felt guilt and shame which kept him right where he was. Let's read the story here in verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. So I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. So the son here is finally going home. That's good. But you can tell he's still underestimating his father's grace. He's assuming his dad will be angry and resentful. And so he even is rehearsing a speech, you know, to give to his dad as he gets there. You can almost imagine him walking on the road home, just kind of rehearsing it. Like, okay, you know, just kind of getting the whole speech together that he's going to tell his dad. And in the speech, he's just saying, I don't, I don't even need to be your son anymore. Just accept me as a hired servant because I know your servants are treated better than the places I'm working today. Now, this decision to go home is the first good decision that this young man has made in maybe the whole story. And he's hoping that his father has some grace and will allow him to just be a servant. But he assumes that the grace doesn't go deeper than that and there's a good piece of wisdom right here that no matter how no matter where you are no matter how many bad decisions you have made god's grace is always deeper than you could imagine you see sometimes we get trapped you know just kind of trapped here thinking we've gone too far we've blown it too much there's no more hope for us But wisdom knows that God's grace is deeper still. And so if you ever find yourself about to eat pig food, it's a good place to stop and think, what would I do now if God really does forgive me? Or maybe ask, What's my next step if grace really could give me a brand new start from here? You see, often we make bad, more bad choices because we feel like our failures already, we feel like ourselves that we are failures already, that we are just total lost causes. And so there's no sense in trying to do anything good anymore. But if we could only think before we leap, and think deep on God's grace, well, it might just present new options we'd never thought of. And finally, what wisdom does is it also teaches us one other thing, and that is to think compassionately about others. Now, the son has sort of come to his senses here in this story, but there's another person who now has a choice to make. And maybe this person has been thinking about it and hoping and praying for the opportunity to make this choice for a long time. And that person is the father. So verse 20, the story continues, but when he was still a long way off, that's the young son, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. 
Now, that is an incredible ending of the story. And what it does is it illustrates for us that the father also had a big choice to make. How would he respond if he ever sees his son again? I mean, his son has basically declared their relationship dead. Likely, this father will never see his son again. But it appears that the father has always been asking the question, but what if he returns? You see, many of our decisions in life have to do with our responses to people around us. People who sometimes hurt, offend us, disappoint us. And it's easy to choose a response quickly without thinking and to respond with anger and vengefulness. But wisdom actually thinks compassionately about others. Now the father in this story has had, it appears, plenty of time to think about his response. And the text says that he sees him coming a long way off down the road. And to me, that suggests that the father has been looking for his son for a long time. Perhaps he comes out the door on the porch and looks out down the road every day, hoping to see his son return. And when his son returns, he's had to ask the questions, how will he respond? I mean, he could respond harshly. He could say, hey, what are you doing here? I'm dead to you, I thought. He could turn him away. And maybe even that was the father's first inclination. But as he looks down that road day after day, he thinks and chooses that if he ever has the opportunity, he will welcome his son home with gladness and compassion. It's good. To, it's a good road to look down during decision making and think, how would a compassionate response bring about a positive result? How would I want someone to respond to me? You see, we're so quick often to respond harshly and to tear people down. Uh, we do it on social media. We do it in real life. And sometimes we even think to ourselves, this person deserves it. And sometimes it's true. People do sometimes deserve what's coming to them. But wisdom knows that often what is best for the person isn't more shame or punishment, but instead is forgiveness, compassion, and grace. And if we are to be wise people, then we will be people who always think compassionately about others. You know, maybe that's what should be so attractive about a church, isn't it? That maybe churches should be communities of people who are always out looking waiting and hoping to show the people around them grace. I mean, I kind of think that wisdom should apply to individuals. We should be people who as individuals are trying to live in wisdom. But I sort of think collectively as groups, we should be too. That as a church community, we should be people who are thinking bigger than ourselves, beyond just what's important for us. And those of us who are kind of in the in group here and what might be most beneficial to us growing as a church or something, we should be thinking bigger than that. We should be thinking longer than our own desires and our own preferences as a group of people because there might be other people in our group with different preferences. We should be thinking further than just our own situation, the things that are you know, important to us, but maybe there's some things important to others as well. We should be thinking deeper about God's grace. If God has been so gracious to us, how might he be gracious to others? And we should be thinking compassionately about others. We should be doing that as individuals. Perhaps we should be doing that collectively as a church. You see, wisdom is not just for individuals. It's for groups of people. And in large part, wisdom is a team sport. And so I'd like to challenge us to that here today as we wrap up this series, that we become the kind of people who exhibit deep wisdom, not just in our own personal lives, but in the way we work together as a group. I'm going to pray for us uh, today. 
and uh, I'm going to lead us into communion here. We have a little video that's going to play, and uh, you can pause it at any point if you'd like to. If you need more time just to commune with Jesus, uh, you're welcome to do that. Uh, if you have those communion elements on hand, you can pull them out and take communion. And then afterwards, I'll come back on the screen and I'll wrap us up with some announcements. But before we go to that, let me just pray for us. And um, as we go into this time, it perhaps can help you just reflect and reset as you go to spend some time in worship with Jesus here today. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you so much today that you do love us. And we thank you that uh, you have shown us how to live life in a way that is full of grace and uh, life itself. And God, we ask that you would help us be people who are constantly growing in wisdom. Uh, as individuals, we want to be people who are living in a way that is more just, that is more righteous, that we would have discernment in knowing what things are good and are um, unkind or unjust, but that you would also give us the courage to step into those things and do them. Uh, but God, we also pray that you would help us as a community to be a group of people who are living in this way of wisdom, that we are living in a way that seeks justice for all. And um, God, help us to be a group of people that is marked by compassion and love and kindness to all who are around us. Uh, we remember, Jesus, that uh, in becoming human uh, and becoming one of us, that you have demonstrated to us what love looks like, that you would empty yourself out for us, that you would allow all the sin and the consequences of sin, death, and, um, and all of that to rebound onto you, that you took it all on in the cross and you triumphed over it by coming back to life and have offered us a new way and to live into new life as well, a new way to live through that type of love and self-sacrifice, uh, a way of life that death can't even defeat. And so we remember that today, we're grateful for it, and we pledge anew to live into that way of life ourselves. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we're going to go to communion. A little video is going to play, uh, and then after communion, I'll see you back here on the screen from, for some announcements as we wrap up. All right, as we wrap up today, I have some announcements for you, some things that are happening that you might want to be aware of. And so I'll let those out for you here real quick. First of all, we do meet in person on Sundays at 10 a.m. Uh, we meet at the Zion Lutheran Church building in Everett. It is just south of Forest Park, which is right off of the 41st Street exit. And uh, you are welcome to join us anytime. It is a really fun group to be around. And uh, if you are an online person and you show up in person, uh, make sure to uh, seek me out, say hello, and say, hey, I'm an online person, and uh, we'd love to introduce you uh, to some of our in-person people as well. Good way to stay up to date on information, things that we're doing, is to follow us on the socials. Uh, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Threads. You can follow us at The Gathering Everett, and you can stay up to date with some information and announcements that are happening. Uh, today's student ministry is happening, uh, so junior high and high school kids will be meeting downstairs at 6 p.m., uh, for some games and some food and some small group discussion. And so if you have a student in junior high or high school or you are a student in junior high or high school, uh, you are invited to attend. Uh, we are having a Theology Pub return here in September as we kind of get back into the swing of things. So Thursday, September 12th, uh, we'll be doing our first uh, Theology Pub of the new season. And we'll be meeting at Elliott Bay Pizza and Pub, which is downtown uh, Mill Creek off of 164th Street. They've got a great food menu. They've got a fantastic beer menu. 
and lots of other drinks as well. And if you want to join us, we'll meet there at 6.30, order food and drinks and stuff, and our discussion will start at 7 p.m. And it's just a casual discussion to talk about spirituality, sometimes theological matters, and uh, there's no teaching element. It's not like a sermon or anything. It's just a group discussion, and it's a real casual environment. And so if that sounds interesting, uh, you are invited to join us then. Also, there is a Faith in Public Life Zoom course that is coming up starting on Wednesday, uh, September 18th. It's going to happen for about seven weeks on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Uh, they're going to be talking about different ways that you can uh, live your faith out in public life. Uh, the first week, uh, each week has a different guest speaker. Uh, this first week that's coming up will be with Dr. Reggie Williams. And uh, he's going to share about Bonhoeffer's struggle to discern his own Christian faith. Uh, and if you know about Bonhoeffer, uh, he lived during uh, World War II and uh, was trying to figure out how does he live in a world where Hitler exists and as a Christian committed to nonviolence and all of that. Um, and so uh, anyway, uh, he'll be sharing a little bit about his book that has to deal with that. And uh, just a really cool opportunity. You can register uh, online. And the best way to do that is we'll put the link to register in uh, the YouTube uh, description here so you can click on that and register if you would like to do that. Uh, coming up on Saturday the 21st, we are going to be doing a salmon barbecue at the church. It's just a fun event. There's nothing really uh, special about it other than we're getting together to have fun, cook some salmon, and hang out together. We'll have some games. Uh, people from the community are invited, so we'll be inviting people around the neighborhood there as well. And we'll be meeting from about 1 to 3 p.m. Uh, we'll eat some food. We'll have burgers and hot dogs in case you don't like salmon. Uh, but salmon will be the main deal there. And uh, we'll just uh, an excuse to have a fun time together, and you are invited to join us on that. Uh, fantasy football has started, and if you ha signed up, Make sure you check your email and jump on, and uh, we don't have any more space, but if you already have signed up, you should have gotten an email, and you need to make sure you click on that to join the league so that we can draft this week before everything gets started. Finally, uh, you can give online if you'd like to donate. You can do that online at our website at evertgathering.com donate. You can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. And uh, we appreciate those of you who have been giving that way. Oh, and I guess also you can sign up for our email newsletter. If you're interested in that um, you, and don't receive it already, you can message us on Facebook with your name and email. Or you can email me. My email's on the screen there. And uh, just give, us, give me your name and say, hey, add me to the email list. And we would be happy to do that. Okay, I think that's everything. That's all the announcements going on. There's some more stuff that will be happening here this fall. We're going to do a pumpkin carving thing and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but we'll fill you in on those as we go along. Hopefully you're enjoying the last vestiges of summer in terms of weather. It's supposed to be really nice again this week, so hopefully you have time to enjoy that. And those of you who are going back to school, God bless you. We hope that goes really well this week too, and we will see you right back here next Sunday. All right, talk to you then. Bye.